You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. No matter the nuances of this decision, and as you'll see, it's quite nuanced, everyone can at least agree that it made for a really bad headline. Canada's Supreme Court rules that self-induced extreme intoxication is now a valid defense against charges of murder and sexual assault, among other things. There's a lot more to this story, but yeah, the optics are not great. That might be one reason why after Canada's Supreme Court allowed that defense in May, the federal Liberals tabled a bill on Friday to ban it. But here's the thing. The defense itself is a lot deeper and more complex than the headline or the political reaction. So what exactly is self-induced extreme intoxication? How do you define it? How do you prove it in court? Why on earth would Canada's highest court consider it a valid defense? And how could it be used in our legal system, for better or for worse, if the Liberals don't ban it? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Pam Rick is the Executive Director and General Counsel at LEAF, the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund. Hi, Pam. Hi. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. No problem. I'd like to set a little bit of a baseline for our conversation because there's a lot more history to this than I was aware. So before we talk about the Supreme Court ruling specifically, when you say that the legal system fails survivors... What do you mean and how do you back that up? Yeah, so first off, when I when I talk about sexual violence and gender-based violence, I'm speaking not just as the executive director uh, of LEAF, but also as somebody who has spent the better part of two decades now as an advocate to end violence against women and gender-based violence, and someone who's also practiced law and advised survivors of sexual violence in uh, criminal and civil proceedings as well. So I, I have a familiarity with these with these issues. And I think some of the things that uh, have continually come up for me over the, the decades include unfounded rates, for example. So we saw Robin Doolittle's groundbreaking important reporting over the last few years about how few cases that are uh, brought to police, how few uh, complaints of sexual violence that are brought to police actually result in charges. And we know that that is a systemic issue. That, that's one thing I would cite. Another is uh, the ways in which uh, myths about uh, sexual assault, about how survivors are supposed to to act or respond, still pervade the justice system. And you don't have to look uh, too far for some prominent examples of that. The one that I would uh, cite is uh, Justice Robin Camp from uh, a few years ago. We saw the judge there uh, having made comments like, why didn't you keep your legs closed? Those sorts of things. So we really see the, the justice system, I think, that the legal system falls short for survivors in those kinds of, of ways. And uh, the, the other thing I would point out is that we we socially, we societally uh, encourage people to report. We want people to go to the police, survivors to uh, to, to make these complaints and to, to hold people accountable through the criminal system, leaving aside whether or not that's right for individual survivors. But we don't prepare them for what it is. And it is a grueling experience, I can tell you, being a sexual assault complainant in a criminal trial, telling your story repeatedly to strangers in public fora, having your credibility questioned. And we don't really set survivors up to understand what that's about. So we need things like independent legal advice properly funded for survivors to at least tell them about their options and prepare them for what this process might look like. Now, can you explain the history of the defense that we're going to talk about today, extreme intoxication? Where did it come from in Canadian law, and and how has it been tested uh, in the past, like in the 1980s, I believe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so many years ago, before we had the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and that was adopted in 1982, uh, we had a a judge-made law, which is also called, called common law, that basically said that no level of intoxication is a defense to crimes of what they call general intent. And that includes crimes like sexual assault. After the Charter was adopted, there was a case heard by the Supreme Court in 1994, and that case was called Davio. And in that case, a man had become incredibly intoxicated by alcohol. He had drunk a great deal 
of alcohol, and he subsequently sexually assaulted a vulnerable woman, somebody who used a, a wheelchair. And he was then charged with sexual assault. And he said at trial, I was so intoxicated that basically I was in a state of what's called automatism. And that means that there's a disconnect between basically the mind and, and the body, that there wasn't control that he was exercising at the time over his actions because of this intoxication. And the thing that I like to point to to sort of give an example of that is uh, you, you think of seizures and somebody's body is moving, but they do not have control over what they're doing. And he said, that's basically the state that I was in. And the judge in that, in that case at trial said, you know what? I, I agree that this is something should, that should lead me to have a, a reasonable doubt about your guilt. So he was acquitted. And ultimately, the Supreme Court in that case, when it heard this appeal, said, we also agree that the defendant should be allowed to raise what is called a defense of self-induced extreme intoxication akin to automatism. And they set a higher threshold for what somebody has to prove to rely on that defense. They said, someone who wants to rely on that defense has to have expert evidence and they have to prove balance of probabilities so that it's more likely than not that they were actually in that state that was, you know, effectively just delusional where they could not control their actions. And the Supreme Court said that is a defense to these types of crimes and sent the, the issue back to, to, for a retrial. Unfortunately, after that, though, the victim died before the case could proceed to a retrial. So that sort of set the stage for a, a huge uproar uh, at the time. In the general public, women's rights groups, uh, people were concerned that having this defense would basically open floodgates. Would say people who are, could go out and get drunk, commit sexual assault, commit gender-based violence, domestic violence, and be let off the hook. So what happened back then that made... This an issue now again in 2022. Well, after this Davio case, Parliament heard the public outcry and Parliament passed a law. And it was a law that was in the criminal code. It was Section 33.1 of the criminal code. And it basically said, no, you cannot rely on that defense for certain crimes, including the crime of sexual assault. And Parliament said, we want to recognize that intoxication and violence against women and children often go hand in hand, and that women and children deserve to have their dignity and equality upheld by the law, and that a way to do that is to prohibit, to bar the use of this defense for crimes including sexual violence. So the Charter barred it. The Supreme Court allowed it, then Parliament barred it again, and this year it made its way back to the Supreme Court. Uh, what were the cases behind the Supreme Court's decision this time? What were they ruling on right now? So there were, there were three cases that made their way up to the Supreme Court, and I should note that there have been many cases since 1994, since the, the law that was Section 33.1 was enacted after the 94 decision, many cases that challenged the constitutionality of that provision. And so these three were the, the, the latest and the only ones that have made their way up to the Supreme Court. And so there are cases that uh, came from Ontario and Alberta. One case, a person consumed magic mushrooms, and then he broke into somebody's house, the house of a stranger, uh, and attacked a woman. The second person uh, consumed magic mushrooms and alcohol, and then he ultimately uh, stabbed his father to death. The third person consumed an overdose of a prescription drug called Welbutrin, which has known psychotic side effects, in a suicide attempt. And he then stabbed uh, his mother. And all three of these men were in basically delusional states when they committed these uh, acts. None of these cases involved sexual violence, I should say, and the Supreme Court notes that as well. But in all of these cases, when these men got to trial, they said the drugs that they consumed caused them to go into what's called that state of automatism, so that delusional state where they don't have voluntary control over their actions. And all three of them argued, or I should say two of, the, two of the three of them argued uh, at trial that Section 33.1 was, was unconstitutional, that it violated their rights to, to liberty in a way that, as we say, doesn't accord with the principles of fundamental justice, and that it also violated their right to be presumed uh, innocent. That ultimately led to, in one case, the judge agreeing, and the accused was allowed to raise the defense, and he was acquitted. And in the other two cases, the judges disagreed, and the defense could not be raised. 
So all of these made their way up to the Supreme Court through provincial appellate courts. And the result was the decision that we saw a couple of weeks ago. Can you summarize that decision for people who may have missed it in the news cycle? What did the court rule and what reasoning did they give? Certainly, the Supreme Court struck down this rule, Section 33.1, as unconstitutional. It said that, and it was a unanimous decision, all nine judges on the court uh, reached this conclusion. They said it violated uh, constitutional rights of accused persons for for three main reasons. It creates what they called a voluntariness breach. And that is a breach of the the general principle that we don't convict people of crimes that they didn't do voluntarily or that for for actions that they didn't do voluntarily. The second uh, issue they said was uh, what they called a substitution breach. And they said that taking this defense off the table basically convicts somebody for a crime, say, of assault, when they have only voluntarily gotten extremely intoxicated. They didn't voluntarily do the the, the assault. So they substitute that that they call like that guilty mind, they, they, that moral that moral guilt of getting extremely intoxicated for the moral guilt uh, or the voluntariness of the crime they've been charged with. So it's assault, for example. And they said that's not constitutional either. And then they said it's also what they call a, a mens rea breach. And that's, you know, a fancy Latin term for a, guilt, a guilty mind, effectively. And that's an, that's an essential component uh, of crimes. And the court said that based on all of these uh, violations of accused persons' rights, the law could not stand and that it wasn't justifiable to have it on the books. In a moment, I want to talk about the reaction to that ruling. But first, as somebody who has argued these cases, as somebody who's fought for victims' rights most of your career, what was your immediate reaction to hearing this verdict? When the decision came out, I worried because I saw also the response um, of, uh, say, the media and the public after the Ontario Court of Appeals decision in this case, where it also said this law is unconstitutional. And there was that same sort of outroar, that that concern that I described following that 1994 case, that this would mean that people could sexually assault with impunity and all you had to do was get a little bit drunk. And I was worried that people would come to understand this case as meaning that, and that would be harmful because it's not accurate. So those are the things that were going through my mind when this decision was released. There was a lot of immediate outrage uh, following the decision. What could have been done better to convey where and how this defense could apply that could have avoided that? And and what do you think was going through the ordinary citizen's mind hearing this ruling? I think the, the ordinary person, and I'll, I'll say actually this is... You know, this is based on some of the concerns that that, that we heard, especially from young people uh, about this case. There was a fear and a kind of a lack of, of certainty about what this meant. Did it mean that if somebody had been intoxicated even a little bit when they had assaulted somebody else, did that mean that they would be given it a free pass effectively? And so there was, and, and I get that, like it's a totally reasonable reaction. These court decisions, uh, the, the specific case, there was one decision in particular that uh, addressed uh, the constitutionality of this provision. It's 100 pages long, and it's uh, a legal decision, and it's uh, it's, it's not, you know, it's not accessible. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's dense for, you know, for even those who have law degrees, I, I'd say. So for the general public and the average person to be able to access what this means, I don't think is, is reasonable. So I get, I get the concern. And so this is why uh, we have you on the show, and I want you to clearly communicate it to me and, and our listeners. I get that this does not mean that an oops, I was drunk, I didn't mean it defense will be permissible. I also get that there may be cases of incredibly extreme intoxication where a person loses control of their intentions. Most of those are somewhere in the middle. What kind of standards will be applied to intoxication as a defense? And and how does that work in a courtroom? Right. So I'm, I'm trying, as I, as I explain what these cases mean, to say it's not just intoxication, it's intoxication that rises to that level of automatism. And how it's going to look in the in courtrooms is that somebody who wants to raise this as a defense is going to have to provide expert scientific evidence that says 
yes, I was in this state when I did this act that I'm accused of doing, they have to satisfy the court on that balance of probabilities, which is an unusual standard in criminal cases. That's why I say it's a very high threshold that somebody uh, needs to meet. At the same time that they can adduce uh, that evidence, provide that evidence, the Crown, who is prosecuting the case, will also be able to provide expert evidence if the you know situation calls for it to say, maybe this doesn't actually rise to that very high high level. Um, so I think there, there are a couple of things that I'm going to be looking for in the, in the months to, in, in years to come if Parliament doesn't take any uh, actions, for example, to, to, to limit the scope of this defence. I'm going to be looking for courts accurately evaluating the defence, looking for that evidence and, and putting the right standards in place to allow somebody to uh, rely on it. I'm going to be looking and hoping that judges, justice system actors will be educated, will educate themselves on how to do this work in this context properly. And I'm also going to hope and advocate for, for governments to not just rely on the criminal system as a place to which we funnel survivors of sexual violence, but to look at and invest in alternative mechanisms to respond to, to sexual violence. And by that, I mean things like restorative justice things that are outside the legal system that might better align with what survivors feel for them is justice. I want to ask what might come across as a naive question here, but when when I hear that it's going to be a matter of proving it to a certain level in a courtroom, what that says to me is this is another way for people with really good lawyers to get away with sexual assault. And I, I'm, I'm not saying this to be difficult. I'm saying this because I, I think that this is in a lot of people's heads when we talk about intoxication as a defense, regardless of how rigorously we hope the standards will be applied. I'd say those are, you know, those are valid concerns that I would, I'd say, you know, a, a couple things in, in response to that specifically. One is that we know right now the justice system is, offers different levels of justice depending on the amount of money that you have, your background, your social location. We know that the criminal law is disproportionately uh, brought to bear on, on Black, Indigenous, and other racialized folks, and that access to justice depends on, on who you are. The thing that I want to emphasize is that the Supreme Court was incredibly clear that intoxication short of that very high bar of automatism is not a defense to these crimes, including sexual violence. So I really want I really want people to understand that this is very much, very much the exception and not the rule. And we will continue at, at LEAF and in our advocacy to try to ensure that that is exactly how this plays out in, in courts, through public education, through uh, ensuring that those who participate in the justice system uh, are aware of the laws and are applying them correctly. Pam, thank you so much for this. I feel like I understand the issue a lot better. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Pam Rick, Executive Director and General Counsel at LEAF the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. As you know by now, you can follow us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. You've probably got the email address memorized if you're still listening, but it is hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca. Feel free to write to us and feel free to call us and leave us a message. The phone number is 416-935-5935. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.